Hello, everyone. Again, it's uh, August 28th today, Friday. Uh, it's not a very good day. Uh, we've had 12 additional deaths since Wednesday. Uh, we're now up to 202 deaths in West Virginia. The 191st death was an 93-year-old 93 male from Fayette County. 192nd death is an 81-year-old male from Clay County. 193rd is a 90-year-old female from Mercer County. 194th is a 67-year-old female from Logan County. 195th is a 93-year-old male from Logan County. 196th is an 81-year-old female from Logan County. The 197th death is an 89-year-old male from Monroe County. 198th death is a 90-year-old male from Monroe County. 199th death, a 72-year-old female from Kanawha County. The 200th death in West Virginia is a 93-year-old female from Logan County. The 201st death is an 82-year-old female from Logan County. And the 2002nd death is a 77-year-old male from Cabell County. Uh, this is not only the, the, it's not the only not very good news. Uh, we have 192 new cases in the past 24 hours, 191 new cases in the past 24 hours. Uh, we have our daily positivity rate that we want, we'd really like to have it below two, but we surely have to have it below three, but it's at 3.14 yesterday. Our active cases have climbed up just a little bit from 1749 to 1763. Our, our hospitalization or our hospitalized patients have dropped from 143 to 133. You'll notice that we have four counties in orange. Kanawha County was yellow yesterday, but they're back in the orange today. Mingo, Logan, and Monroe are the other three. Our RT level is still good. It's at 8.89, which is the sixth best in the nation. So that part's good, but uh, you know, dang, I just hate so badly, you know, that, uh, you know, when we get an outbreak, no matter what, how it gets there, you know, whether it's someone that's traveled to possibly Myrtle Beach or whatever it may be, you know, or how it gets there, once it gets there, it brings bad, bad tidings. And, uh, and so please keep all these great West Virginians and great people in your thoughts, your prayers. I mean, it's terrible. It's just plain terrible, but, uh, but this disease and this killer that we're dealing with, we know is tough stuff. I think we've lost uh, maybe slightly in excess of 180,000 people in the United States. And uh, to have lost 202 from West Virginia is amazing. That's, I mean, that's for sure, but at the same time, that's sad. That's really sad. 202 people. Great people, great families, and so please remember them. Uh, we have 33 outbreaks today in our long-term care facilities, and the largest outbreaks are in Grant County, in Kanawha County, we've got Cedar Ridge and Marmette Nursing Home. In Logan County, you know of Trinity there, you know of Princeton Healthcare Center, you know in Grant County back is the Grant Rehab Center, uh, and, uh, Grant Rehab and Care Center, Monroe County Springfield Center, Raleigh County the Pine Lodge Nursing Home, and uh, in Taylor County, Rosewood Nursing Home. We've had our first death, you know, in our correctional facilities now. It's a 40-year-old Wood County man and uh, that was being held on federal charges there. You know, we, we think we, we're confirming, reconfirming, but uh, that he died, uh, you know, of, of complications from COVID, but, uh, but we're, we're working on that. You know, the uh, 
Now in the South Central uh, Correctional Facility, we have seven active inmate cases and 57 uh, have, inmates have recovered with 13 inmate tests pending. Uh, corrections have also been conducted, conducted at, on a second round basis of enhanced testing at Mount Olive. Uh, so far we have 162 inmates and 35 staff there that have tested negative. As of now, Mount Olive has 32 active inmates and five active employee cases. And, uh, and our corrections people are staying on top of that as best we possibly can. You're gonna hear a lot today from uh, Superintendent Birch and Dr. Marsh, you know, uh, among others about how we're gonna go back to school and all the different aspects of that. But I wanna, you know, I'm really happy, you know, this, this part of the, of the briefing today is really good. But I want to talk just a second about Highmark. Highmark has stepped up and donated an, a, an additional $500,000 in PP, PPE and cleaning supplies to the Department of Ed that will help ensure that, uh, that we'll be able to just do more and more and more that will absolutely ensure the safety and, and the wellness of our schools and, so, and, and, and our people that are at the schools. So, on behalf of the Department of Ed, the state of West Virginia, and all of us, we surely, surely recognize and thank Hallmark because uh, wonderful, wonderful, generous donation and uh, it'll be used very, 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 you know, happily. Um, on our county readiness, you know, over the past month, the Department of Education surveyed all 55 counties in the school system to determine exactly what PPE and cleaning supplies that they need to be able to start. Now, as we go forward, we know we're gonna have more and more and more demands and everything. And with the dollars that we have and that we've got in CARES and with the grant money that we have and everything, we'll be able to cover these other demands. You know, you've gotta remember that the federal government put $90 million into the state of West Virginia, actually a few million more than $90 million in funds from the federal and state government to use it for our school re-entries. You know, now, you know, Secretary Birch is gonna be talking to us today, but, uh, but in just a few minutes, but we, we can confidently, confidently say that all 55 counties, you know, will have what they re requested to be able to begin school. Okay, from the unemployment you know, side, you know, we, we are now, you know, have been approved with our application for the FEMA dollars of 68,269,946 dollars. And this is to go towards sending all of our applicants the $400 that we're talking about but this is only 300 of the 400. West Virginia, I really, really proudly say, West Virginia is one of the only states in, in the country there is a handful, but there's, you know, and it's growing a little bit. But West Virginia stepped up and said, no, we're not going to just send the 300 when the 300 comes, we're going to send the 400. And so to be able to send the 400, West Virginia had to step up and do the extra 100 and that'll be, That'll be going out and we'll be getting those West Virginians some money as quickly as we possibly can. And you know, I wanna thank President Trump for signing, signing the order, the executive order that authorized the funding, but, uh, but we had to pick up the other 25%. I'm really proud that we were, be able, that we were able to do that. You know, in, in regard, there was a question in regard to veterans grants and everything, and we, we've been digging into it and trying to figure out how many and who's going to be giving the who's going to who is going to be given the grants and and we're working on it with uh, our secretary Dennis Davis and Dennis does an incredible job and he's he, he lightens the room all the time when he's around I love him to death what an incredible incredible man and so but we're working on it but we just don't have it all quite put together so I'm gonna I'm gonna have to update you a little bit more on that on Monday as far as the Mon County bars, we're preparing to open on August the 31st. You know, in order to reopen these bars, you know, our, these bars are going to have to have to follow very stringent safety guidelines. And our agencies are working on a plan 
to potentially expand their outdoor space capabilities, especially for weekend crowds. So uh, we're working with them. I'm happy that, the, 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 that our businesses are going to be able to go back and, uh, and, and, and reopen and everything, but, uh, but we're going to have to stay on top of it. And if we have to back away from it, we will. We, we urge everyone to be super safe in that, in that arena because we know that that's an arena that can really cause us a lot of trouble. From our small, small business grants, you know, we, we, have, uh, we have now 2,900 applications that have been submitted and we have awarded uh, $10.6 million. We're continuing to take applications from sole proprietors and our businesses that have one to 35 employees. So please keep signing up there and we'll just keep sending the money if we, as fast as we can get you qualified. Uh, our total Awards to date for our cities and counties are right under 95 million now. It's 183 cities and counties that have applied so far, and uh, we're we're pumping that out the door just as fast as we possibly can. You know, there as well. Our free testing today will be in Mineral and Mason counties, and this weekend we'll be in Mason, Jackson, Monroe, and Webster counties. Next week we'll be in Logan and Jackson County. And uh, again, I urge you, the more we test, the more we know, the more we test with our minorities, the better off we'll be, you know, so get there and, and get tested. You know, if you have any apprehension whatsoever, go get tested. It's not going to cost you a dime and it is absolutely painless. I keep saying the same thing over and over. We don't want a West Virginia to go hungry and go unfed and everything. We've got 696 sites. If you're having a problem and you haven't heard me in the past, call 211 and we'll take care of you. You know, uh, West Virginia, hey, way to go, West Virginia. I just got this. West Virginia has now climbed to 90.6% of our residents have been counted so far, above 90. Way to go, West Virginia. Idaho is still ahead of us. They're at 95.4. Let's keep after them and, and, and catch them. And Washington is right on our tail at uh, 89.6. So stay after it, West Virginia. We've got to get counted. We only have till the 30th of September, and you're doing a great job with this. And thank you so much for all the help that people have given me on, on that. You know, this afternoon I will be on a virtual call with several county superintendents across West Virginia. It's again, it's, a, it's just a, a follow-up call, you know, double, triple checking that we're ready to go. We plan to discuss school re-entry and I want to hear exactly what the challenges are that they're facing and to make sure that all of us are doing everything we possibly can to help. We have done, we have, we've been in constant contact with these superintendents. You know, again, give uh, S Superintendent Birch all the accolades, you know, I think we've got a real plan. We're going to do the very best we can. It's not going to be perfect. Everybody needs to know we're going to have problems. We're going to have some level of problems. It won't be perfect, but I think absolutely it's a good plan. And I think we've got to continue to try to move forward. Uh, there's, there's been Hurricane Laura, Laura, Laura. Hurricane Laura, you know, hit the Gulf Coast and hit it as a, a Category 4, I think, hurricane. And, and at, that, at that time, you know, they expected really, really bad stuff. As, as I think as of this morning, that there were six that have been identified, you know, that they've lost. And, uh, and there's tons and tons of damage, but I don't think it's as bad as what everybody thought. But just so happens, it's curling and coming right toward us. By the time it gets to us, it, it, it should be a tropical, not storm, but a tropical depression. You know, I, you know, today I'm declaring a state of preparedness for all 55 counties. I do not think this is going to be bad. I don't think we ought to be super alarmed, but at the same time, we know what flooding can do. I would caution everyone that uh, if you get water running across a road, you know, I heard one of our first responders the other day saying it only takes six inches of water to float and start moving a vehicle. So it does not take much water coming across the road and everything. Please don't drive through the water. Bad, bad move, you know. And so, uh, but uh, 
Also, the month of September, we are, we are, are moving it into a preparedness month. And, uh, and throughout the month of September, the West Virginia Emergency Management Division will be encouraging West Virginians to prepare now for disasters that may come in the future. You know, it, uh, gosh, it just seems like we've been through, we've been through so much preparedness, it's unbelievable. And so, uh, just hang with me, West Virginia. We're getting close. I know, you know, you got to remember just one thing. You know, if you're squirrel hunting or whatever it may be, and you're wanting to climb up on top of the ridge, you know, maybe you're going up there to bow hunt or, or just going up there to hike. But just think about it. When you start up that mountain, it's not too terrible steep. And then as you go, the last part of the mountain is always the steepest. And absolutely right now, we're in the last part of the mountain until we'll have a drug or a vaccine. But absolutely, I know, I know how easy it would be to slide back down and say, oh, heck, we just can't make it up there and slide down. And then we start regressing and that's bad. Right now is when you really got to suck it up, West Virginia. And hang with me. Hang with me. We're going to get there and everything. But I know it's tough. I know it's really tough. I guess at this time, you know, if I could just touch on the graphs just one second, and then I'm done. If you look at our recovered and our active cases, we, we, keep, we keep moving and getting a little wider, and that's good. That part's good. But if you look at the middle thing and our daily positives, that's the thing that bothers me. We just jumped up to 3.1% today, and you can see that little tick up on the end of that line, and that's not, that's not what we want. In our cumulative number still, still is 2.34. That part's pretty good. Uh, you know, I, uh, I think that's really all I've got, you know, and, and in just a few minutes you'll hear from Secretary Birch and, uh, and all the rest of us. All right, thank you, Governor. Let's now go to Clayton Birch, our West Virginia Superintendent of Schools. <clears throat> thank you very much. I'd like to uh, pick up uh, where the Governor left off, and that is preparedness. Um, he mentioned the uh, county superintendents, and um, each one of them had been working. And as a matter of fact, we uh, invited one of the superintendents to uh, the uh, roundtable we did with Dr. Burks. And um, that particular superintendent said, listen, I've been preparing since uh, March 13th. Uh, knowing that we've got to get kids back to school. So the superintendents, the leadership, the teachers have just done an excellent job getting ready. But I think there's a few things to keep in mind as I prepare for the report today, and that is um, we want to continue focusing on parental choice. Um, the parents have got to have a decision and a choice to make of whether or not it is um, in person, uh, whether or not it is virtual. Um, we are doing everything we can to assist the counties and help them to make sure that they're prepared for either mode. Um, so we also know that those local plans have been turned in. There is a lot of local control that we're focusing on, decisions they're making for blended learning, other models. And, you know, I just want to thank the, uh, the governor and um, the, uh, Dr. Clay Marsh and the folks at uh, DHHR with Secretary Crouch and to be able to adjust and do the right thing for our folks in the marching band and others so we can make sure it's equitable and everybody gets to participate. And I think that uh, everything that uh, Bernie Dole and the SSAC has done is uh, done in the spirit of let's try to give these children um, as much normalcy as possible, but um, I want to transition that discussion just a little bit to why the map is so important. Uh, we continue to talk about the metrics. Um, on our website, we have a hotline now. It's 304-957-1234. Uh, there's a person there every single day from 8 o'clock until 4 o'clock. Um, they'll take your calls. They'll help you get connected to anybody within the Department of Education, your local county school system. They will help you get connected to DHHR, your local health department. Wherever it is, we can assist you with your question. But right now, many of the questions tend to, uh, to be about um, gearing up, being excited, whether it be, you know, when do I need to pay attention to the map? What days are really, really important? So I want to just say that there's going to be a new frequently asked questions. We're going to post. It'll be with the, uh, the color coding map. 
And I just want to quickly say, let's talk about two very important dates. This Saturday at 9 p.m. is the first time the Department of Education will take an official snapshot of the, uh, the county alert system. We will post it on our website along with uh, right above what the Kellers mean. And if you are green or yellow, you are good to go to begin competing with athletics next week. If you're orange, you can continue practicing. And if you're red, uh, of course, we know that it's a danger zone and everything is closed down. And we uh, kind of uh, say that's our trial run for the big date, and the big date is September 5th. Every Saturday at 9 o'clock, you'll be able to see the map. And on September 5th, that map will guide you into opening of schools. If you're green or yellow, we will open all in person uh, that uh, your county has decided how it's going to open, as well as virtual. If you're orange or red, we're going to begin virtual and remote until you turn green or yellow so we can give you the best chance to start. And I know that Dr. Marsh and Secretary Crouch have been uh, very, very helpful in the frequently asked questions. Um, we definitely encourage uh, counties, if they need to make adjustments to their plans, if they want to make changes, please continue communicating to your county. Talk to your principals. Talk to your county board of education. Um, many of the counties, if they want to make adjustments, they're contacting us after board meetings saying, listen, we want to offer an additional uh, virtual school spaces. We want to look at our in-person. So we really appreciate that even the counties are listening to the folks who want options, and we want to continue encouraging that. One thing brought to our attention, I know that um, uh, those that listen to me speak on my weekly uh, video that I put out hear me talk about the one caring adult. They hear me talk about how important it will be for children to have the extracurricular, the sports. But right now what I've told the, our 55 superintendents is our focus has to be September 8th and as many children as we get back into the education cycle as possible. We have got to, uh, we've really got to focus on that date and do what we can. So my own county, I get a text each and every day that reminds me what killer. Uh, my children, uh, it's county is, and I prepare with them each and every day of what we've got to do, and um, uh, I think the counties have really embraced this, and I encourage everybody to keep looking at the map. It will guide you in our decisions. So with that, thank you. All right, thank you. Next, we'll go to Dr. Clay Marsh, our coronavirus czar. Well, good afternoon. It's uh, great to be with you today. As the governor said, that we, like other places around the country, are seeing that although the number of cases of COVID-19 seem to be reducing, that the number of deaths from COVID-19 are not reducing at the, at the same rate at all. And I think that, as we've said before, that comes from largely COVID-19 going from urban centers where there may be younger people and more healthcare assets to rural places, as we've seen in West Virginia, where we have more vulnerable people and perhaps uh, people who have more uh, comorbidities. Uh, so it's really important, as we've heard Superintendent Birch talk, we've heard the governor talk, we've gone through the number of people that have died in West Virginia. And although it's good relative to other states nationally, it's not nearly as good as we want to be. And this is really an issue of us controlling the spread of COVID-19 in each of our communities. And particularly as school is going back in, we know that this is going to be the trickiest part of what we have navigated thus far for our state with COVID-19. Certainly with the governor's leadership and Superintendent Birch and, and, um, and Secretary Crouch and DHHR and all the people that have really put in endless hours to make this the safest, best plan and opportunity that we can make it, we know that ultimately the success or failure of the next part of us living more um, resonantly and successfully with COVID-19 really becomes the individual decisions each one of us makes. We know that today more children are infected with COVID-19 in our country than ever before. We know that children that are admitted to the hospital have an equal chance of going to an ICU as adults going to our hospitals. Many fewer children have to go to the hospital, but we know that this is not a benign process and problem for children or adults. And we also know that not only from Hong Kong, but now from the United States, 
that in Nevada, we apparently have our first case of reinfection with COVID-19. And as opposed to what we saw in Hong Kong, where that second infection was much milder, the person in Nevada seems to be sicker with the second infection. So it really tells us that we need to be very careful and we want to protect ourselves, protect ourselves from the complications of COVID-19, but also protect ourselves from being able to spread. And as we've put out in our official communications from DHHR, from the governor's office, we will continue to test very aggressively because identifying people that can spread COVID-19, the quote unquote super spreaders, is a real um, contribution to success for the state of West Virginia, to keeping our schools, uh, to, uh, to allowing our schools to open and stay open, to getting back on the sports fields, and to be able to live in a healthy way with our vulnerable population. And so as we go for West Virginia, this is the particularly hardest thing that we've done, and we need to do this together because the connected nature of what we've been able to do to date has been our single success factor, and the governor said this repeatedly, and I agree wholeheartedly, but it's really time to prove what a great state and a great community and great people that care about each other and love each other and protect each other it's time to really show what that's about. So thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Marsh. Next, we'll go to Bill Crouch, Secretary of the West Virginia DHHR, and Dr. Ayn Amjad, our State Health Officer. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Jordan. Um, I'm pleased to announce today that DHHR will receive $43.7 million uh, in federal funding from the U.S. Uh, Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, the uh, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration uh, funds uh, programs through DHHR, through our Bureau uh, of Behavioral Health. Um, and those are to help assist us in continuing our efforts to battle the opioid crisis in West Virginia. Uh, this is the first distribution in SAMHSA's funds of, a two, of its two-year opioid uh, response grant program, the state opioid response uh, program. States are funded to develop tailored approaches to prevention, treatment, and recovery from opioid use disorders. The program provides access to life-saving evidence-based medication to treat opioid use disorders, along with psychosocial services and community support. Um, under Governor Justice, uh, we have made great strides in, in fighting this epidemic. Uh, we know that using evidence-based programs uh, work. Uh, we also know we have much to do, and these funds will help us move in that direction. Grants like these are critical to our efforts in West Virginia to get care to those who need it. Um, one other issue, and I'll, I will try to be a little brief, a, a brief here. We are getting a lot of questions and comments, many through social media, uh, regarding the county alert system and specifically the data that goes into those calculations. We'll try to provide a little bit more information with regard to that data and, and, uh, and the issues involved in that. Uh, it seems that everyone wants to perform those calculations themselves. Um, the calculations are not that difficult. The, the, these are subtraction, multiplication, uh, very simple calculations. It's the data that goes into these calculations that are critical to the, to the results. Uh, what makes it complicated is the flow and the timing and the date of the reports we get. Uh, first, we use new cases per day in calculation of the rolling incidence rates, whether that's a seven day or a 14 day. Uh, we are conducting approximately 4,000 to 6,000 tests on average a day. Uh, yesterday, for example, was 5,820 tests. Those results come into the local health department and to the State Bureau of Public Health throughout the day from, from a large number of labs across the, the country and, and in the state. Uh, each time a lab result comes in uh, by the various labs, the positive results in, in those, uh, from those labs change the calculation. So uh, to make this a little more complicated, those results, as you know, are delayed many times by days. So uh, we're trying to speed that process up. We, we've signed on three new labs in the last week. So we're trying to expand laboratory capacity and make sure that we get a quicker turnaround time. Uh, our cutoff for the numbers is midnight the evening before. 
uh, the calculation is, is, is completed and uploaded with the uh, updates at 10 a.m. on the dashboard. Um, but the other critical part of that calculation is pulling out patients and inmates, patients from nursing homes and inmates from prisons. Uh, those numbers are excluded because they do not contribute to community spread. There's a part of the congregate spread. So that is being done manually. And I want to, uh, as always, thank the Guard for their support. Uh, General Hoyer has um, placed additional folks into the Bureau of Public Health to, to assist in that process. Uh, so as we discussed, pulling those out of the calculation, um, looking at what those numbers are at midnight is, what, is where, we, uh, where we end up with regard to the numbers we use for the calculation. Um, to, to add to that one final point in terms of, the, of pulling out nursing home patients and inmates, those aren't on the lab reports that we get in. There's no information with regard to the lab report that says this is a patient in a nursing home or this is an inmate in a facility. So that has to be done manually. And again, that's where uh, the guard has, has been assisting us in that process. Those investigations are completed multiple times during the day and sometimes take longer than one day. So we're trying to speed up getting that information in terms of what we pull out of that calculation. Uh, we are looking at, at how quickly we can automate this. It's not automated at this time, uh, but it is a process that we're, we're learning as, uh, as we move through this, how to improve it and how to make it better. So I hope that that helps. The, the data that is used to make the calculations is, is not available to the public or, or folks in, throughout the state to actually replicate that calculation exactly. To try to assist with that, we, we keep saying we're going to be transparent, and, and we are. We're going to provide more of that information on the dashboard, either through a drop-down or through a table, including the population data that is used, which is uh, 2019, July 2019 census uh, estimates. Uh, and we'll provide, we'll, we'll provide a sample calculation so folks can see how that is done. We want to make sure everyone understands this and how it works. Um, but it is a snapshot in time, much like our testing is a snapshot in time from that standpoint. Uh, so we will, uh, we will try to update this. We'll try to be transparent and put more information on the website. Uh, I know there's some frustration out there at not being able to replicate what we're doing. That is, that is impossible to do without the exact data at midnight that's used to uh, compile to put in the calculation. There will be errors. I want to make sure everyone understands. Part of this is a manual system. So it's very difficult to have a manual system that does not ultimately result in an error somewhere. When that happens, we will let you know. We will notify it and notify of you if it's a serious error. We've already made a couple of corrections in counties where we've been notified that uh, information is, is incorrect. We go back and look at those counties and pull that data out and make sure it's correct. And again, we appreciate that. We need that cooperation from the local health departments and others to try to make this work uh, seamlessly. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you. All right, thank you both. Major General Hoyer with the West Virginia National Guard is also joining us today and is available for questions. We'll now go to questions from members of the media. The first today is from Charles Young with the WV News. Hi, this is Charles Young with WV News. Um, Governor, could you clarify what you said about the inmate who passed away? Do we not know yet at this point if his death was uh, COVID related? And is there any other information you could share with us about him? Thank you. Uh, Charles, let me let me get back to this just one second, and then I'll 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 tell you what more I know. I know he's the 40 year old from Wood County, but uh, uh, just one second, hold tight with me. Uh, all right, what basically I, I'm told, you know, Charles is uh, first death, as we've said before. A 40-year-old, you know, Wood County gentleman and everything. However, however, you know, he, uh, the preliminary assessment from health officials attributes the death to complications from COVID. However, it says that we, that there, there were several other health complications involved. And, and so, so when it says preliminary assessment that's what I was referring to you about and everything and because I you know I'm 
I'm a guy that's hung up on telling you the truth and everything, and I don't want to tell you something and then come back and have to take it back in a lot of different ways, but that was it. All right, thank you, Charles. Next, we'll go to Paul Mullen with WCBC. Good afternoon, Governor. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, question will go to uh, Sec um, Superintendent Birch about how many people are opting out of school for their children this fall on an overall basis, and is there an area of the state where that is more prevalent than other areas of the state? Thank you. Sure. So um, opting out of school, um, we've actually not heard of a lot of cases up till now, and we won't until the final en enrollment numbers come in. Um, I do update the, uh, the governor and uh, his staff on our virtual numbers. We want to make sure those parents continue to have options. And I can tell you that right now we're at about 27% of parents now that have signed up for virtual, which means 73% have decided to continue going in person. So um, I will continue to uh, assist any parent, and our county superintendents will assist any parent. We want to continue stressing choice, choice, choice to those parents in person, uh, virtual, um, and for some, they, uh, they could even make additional uh, choices, whether it be uh, private or homeschooling. <clears throat> All right, thank you, Paul. Next, we'll go to Larissa Casillas with Next Star Media. Hi, this is Larissa with WOW KTV in Charleston, and we've had a lot of questions from viewers regarding the lost wages program and this funding from FEMA, as well as the $100 that was pledged by the West Virginia government, and they just want to know when this kicks in. I know you said soon, but is there a timeline or something that needs to happen first for it to actually kick in? Well, I think I, I got this and everything, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm not the authority. Scott Atkins is more of an authority on this and everything, you know, with workforce. But, uh, but I can say this, and, and this, this is my take, is, you know, we had to wait on the funds to come from FEMA to be able to send it out, send them out and everything. They're covering the $300, the, the $300, $100 is coming from the state. But I think those dollars are going to be coming out and they're going to be coming out really, really soon. So, uh, so, you know, we just, I, I guess we just got the letter today, you know, telling, telling us that the dollars were coming from FEMA. Usually that happens just right behind that and it comes in a wire transfer pretty quickly. And so, so I think, I think we'll be going out with that very, very soon. And and, and the other thing too, it's all retroactive. I think it's retroactive back to August the 1st. And so, so, you know, what will happen is a lot of people will be getting a lot, you know, a great big check because it'll be covering, for the most part, it'll be covering four and a half weeks. And so, so it, it'll be a really nice, you know, check and uh, we hope and pray it just came in time. All right, thank you, Larissa. Next, we'll go to Ryan Quinn with the Charleston Gazette Mail. Governor, are you planning now to use any of that $1.25 in CARES Act money to help schools start the school year safely? If not, why not? I know you said you're confident schools have what they need to start. Why and how are you confident? You previously said schools had 94 million and you'd find more money if they ran out. Now I'm hearing of teachers and counties lacking masks, cleaning supplies and computers. And you said the state didn't have the capability to test all students and staff before classes started. So it seems like the money is insufficient for that too. And Senator Capito and Representative Mooney uh, even said just last week they're working to get $105 billion from the federal government to help schools across the U.S. So that seems to contradict the idea that schools have enough funding. Okay, Ryan, your question is long and everything. It's got a lot of different aspects and everything. I don't think I said that I was going to test every child and everybody and everything. I don't think that, that, that I don't think I said that. But nevertheless, that really doesn't matter. What we re really matters is just this. We want the safest and the best atmosphere that we can possibly have for our kids, our teachers, our service personnel, everyone. That's what we want. We want the very, very best. Now, in doing so, and I'm going to pass to Secretary Birch in just one second, but I want to just tell you just this. There is no way, there's no way in the world 
that I'm going to have our schools reopen and everything if Secretary, Superintendent Birch is telling me that there are superintendents that don't have the supplies they need to be able to reopen. Now, in addition to all that, you know, Ryan, you got to know that we, we, keep, we keep really watching the CARES money in every way. Now, if we get into a situation to where we need dollars and we don't have those dollars in grants or we can, and we need to pull more CARES money out, we can do it. We can absolutely do it, you know, because, because the way that, that things are working from the standpoint of the small business applications or the unemployment situation, there's dollars. There's significant dollars that are there that we can move that way, and we will move that way immediately upon needing that. In addition to that, in addition to that, we're waiting for this, this additional stimulus package to come. And, and when it comes, and it will come soon, when it comes, there'll be another great big bump of dollars that will absolutely be able to be, a, you know, to put, put towards making things, elongating things and continuing to do things to make things better and better. And, you know, and so, so I, I would tell you that all of us, all of us support any and all dollars that we can keep moving in toward our schools and keep everything moving. And I'll pass now to uh, Secretary Birch. Sure. Thank you, Governor. So a couple of things. One, I will reiterate, communicate, communicate, communicate. Um, I have to trust the 55 superintendents that uh, we meet with on a weekly basis. Um, as a matter of fact, when the $86 million of CARES funding went out, we then um, had additional competitive funds that uh, we allowed them to help fill the gaps with. Um, I cannot thank them enough. Uh, many of them applied. Um, they also looked at additional dollars they had themselves. So they have really, really been looking to see what needs they have. Once all that was completed, we actually did another survey to ask them, are there any additional needs? And that is where the communication has to be key. Um, anybody who believes they do not have enough PPE or disinfectant or anything, hand sanitizer, they've got to let us know. We have General Hoyer, we have DHHR, everybody is on board to assist with this. Um, I, it, 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 no time do I ever feel reluctant if I needed to, uh, to go to the governor and ask for additional dollars, um, but uh, he knows that uh, we are really, really, really good stewards. Um, of the dollars we receive. We're going to make them uh, count. And uh, finally, I believe in there was the idea that uh, computers. That is probably the number one thing we've heard, and we are working with each and every county to try to get those. That is actually not a, necessarily a money issue. That is a supply and demand issue. Um, so we have narrowed that down to very few counties that are left, and uh, we will continue working with them. All right, thank you, Ryan. Next, we'll go to Taylor Stuck with the Herald-Dispatch. Hi everyone, it's Taylor. Um, I have a similar question, but for higher education. Um, what support is the state providing universities as they continue to do testing throughout the semester, including funding? Is there any more funding that might be coming to the universities to help support their testing on campus? Dr. Marsh, can you answer, can you answer that? Uh, so um, thank you for the question. The um, universities through, the, through Chancellor um, Tucker and the Higher Education Policy Commission has worked with schools and provided uh, resources uh, through the governor and, and, uh, and other uh, assets, uh, DHHR, to be able to facilitate, uh, to be able to facilitate uh, testing uh, uh, appropriately. And those testing might be different depending on what the school is. Some schools had already planned for that testing, um, including West Virginia University, I believe including West Virginia State, and maybe a couple of others. So that plan had already been implemented. But other schools in the state have worked with our health officials and, and certainly through uh, HEPSI and Chancellor Tucker to make those uh, tests available for the appropriate students and faculty that were coming back on college campuses to, to make sure that that environment was safe. 
back to me just one second. Uh, you know, I, I just want to follow up by, by just saying this. You know, when, when, when all this came up, we gave all the, uh, the, the colleges, and, and, you know, dollars to be able to test not only just the in-state, I mean, out-of-state students, but all students. And we found, we found from that that we had a bunch of, of uh, residents in West Virginia students that we found, now not many, a little bit less than 1%, but we found some that were positive. And by finding them, that made just us have the ability to be able to keep them from spreading to others and everything. Now, I think that WVU and Marshall, you know, took care of their own, and these dollars were really to go to our smaller institutions, and I think we've done that, and I think as we go forward, if we need additional testing as we go forward, we'll continue to assist. All right, thank you, Taylor. Next to Emily Allen with West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Hi, all. This is Emily Allen with uh, Public Broadcasting. My question would be for Secretary Crouch and Major General uh, Hoyer. I just want to understand, why is it again that nursing home cases and correctional facility cases, in terms of this county alert map, um, why are those mixed? And how actually does the National Guard go through those results? Um, how are samples organized on their ways to labs if it allows for that kind of mixing and requires the National Guard sort through that? Um, and I also want to just ask at this point, um, what is the average turnaround time for those test results in correctional facilities and long-term care facilities? Yeah, this is Bill Crouch. I'll, uh, Governor, if it's okay, I'll start here. Mm -hmm. Uh, I understand, I'm not sure I understand the question, Emily, with regard to why are nursing homes and correctional facilities mixed, but, but I think your, your point may be why are we pulling those two uh, groups out of the calculation? And the reason for that is uh, those, in, those, uh, those individuals in nursing homes uh, and in correctional facilities and prisons do not go back out into the community to mix with the other with the rest of the population. The employees of nursing homes and the guards of the prisons are included in that calculation because they do go home uh, after their their shift, after they work, and they again go to Kroger's and go to uh, gas stations and mix with the rest of the population. So, uh, what we're trying to do, and that began actually weeks ago before we got into uh, and were asked to participate in the um, in the map process and and in the calculations of incidence rates uh, to, to show different levels of, of incidence in the community, we began to look at pulling those individuals out uh, uh, several weeks ago for that very reason that they don't contribute to that spread. Uh, with regard to the guard, uh, the question for the guard, and I'll let the general speak to that, I, I can only assume you're referencing what I spoke to earlier, which is having the guard assist in trying to contact facilities and contact prisons to get that information pulled out quicker so that we know uh, of the information we receive rather than wait for an investigation through the county health departments who are doing a great job, but sometimes the number of investigations create a lag in time for them to verify which are, which are patients of nursing homes, which are inmates, uh, so that we can pull those out. So the Guard's been very beneficial, very useful to us, and, and we always appreciate their assistance in, in providing additional manpower to us. So I hope that answers the question. Uh, General Hoyer, you want to jump in there? Uh, Bill, I'd just add a couple of things. As the Secretary pointed out, uh, uh, there are processes here that unfortunately, because of the nature of what we're dealing with, are not automated. So what the Guard is doing is providing manpower to DHHR to improve the throughput process of the information coming to DHHR by making direct contact with, with entities just like we've done or for a good period of time now from the start of the pandemic with the local health departments. Part of it is to take some of the burden off the reporting process of the local entity so they have more time to focus on other other activities. So, and down the road where we can attempt to automate, uh, we will, but need to understand that the throughput issue resides at being able to get data from the locals and take burden off of them. 
The other thing I would point out is the other entity that is not considered in this number are the regional jails because the difference in the way uh, inmates may move in and out of those more uh, more rapidly. And General Hoyer, this is uh, just Bill Crouch. If I could jump back back in one second, let me mention also that I've I've talked before about moving to a new surveillance system, and we're probably a little more than halfway through doing that. The system is called Checks Out. So we're still dealing with two systems. Once we get everyone onto the, the new system, which uh, the target date for that is September 11th, we're moving counties on every, actually do this over the weekend. Our folks uh, uh, set this up so that uh, we do it uh, and when there's a little bit of downtime. Once we get to the new system, in fact, they're already looking now at how we might automate this process. But the simple explanation is when a test is done uh, and, and the information is placed uh, onto the end of the system, it does not include anywhere or a field to include whether or not that individual might be a patient in a nursing home or an inmate in a facility. So we don't have a way to automate that right now, but we're looking to do that. All right, thank you, Emily. Next to Kenny Bass with WCHS and Fox 11. Hi, this is Kenny Bass with Channel 8 and Fox 11 in Charleston. I want to back up to uh, extracurricular activities and football games. And, and I, I understand that Superintendent Birch was once again praising the SSAC for its work. Um, and I appreciate his comments on that. But it does appear to people who are contacting us and when we look at the way the, the edicts are uh, dispersed that the SSAC appears to be leading the way on pandemic related questions regarding statewide rules for participants and spectators and extracurricular athletic activities with local county health departments taking a back seat there had been a plan approved in Greenbrier County they were ready to go they had uh, their uh, their specifications in place and then the SSC came out with its statewide rules and overrode it. So how does that jibe with the local control that that Superintendent Birch and the, the governor have been talking about throughout this thing? And why does it look like that the SSAC is uh, pulling this wagon instead of local county health departments? Thank you. Go, sir. Absolutely. Thank you, Kenny. So um, you're right, I have praised the SSAC because every time uh, this is fluid, things change. Every time something has come up, they have attacked it, um, just as we have with education. Uh, but I do believe there has to be some uniformity because we do have counties versus counties. So we need to make sure there's some uniformity when we work with our health officials because we are having these students cross from county to county. So we need some uh, uniformity there. Um, so. Um, we do uh, ask our health officials for their input all the time, and uh, just as we saw earlier this week, you know, when we're challenged with something, can we do it healthy, can we do it safe? Um, I have to give credit to Bernie Dolan and the group up there. They, uh, they do step up and work directly with us to make that happen. Um, the, the, the worst thing we could have would be to have um, 140 high schools in the state um, playing under different rules when it comes to the health and safety. Okay, thank you, Kenny. Next, we'll go to David Beard with the Dominion Post. Hi. Uh, I wonder if it's possible to elaborate a bit more on what we're looking at for the expanded oper outdoor opportunities for the Mon County bars. Is it a kind of a toned down Bourbon Street thing minus the beads where the, it could be closed off to traffic and people could walk up and down the street with uh, drinks in hand? Or is it something more limited, like a few extra outdoor tables in front of each facility? Thanks. David, I, I can't answer that question really well right now and everything, but I, is, there, is there anybody, you know, could Secretary Crouch answer it or, or, or I'll tell you what, let me just, let me just go to my, my general counsel and let him, let him answer the question a little bit better because he, he knows it better than I. Okay, so Dave, we're still working on those rules right now with the ABCA, and, and we're going to be presenting those to local officials. But in essence, you would still have outdoor activity that would be more closed and limited. Each establishment would have a fenced-in area uh, that would be unique to it. You could not carry alcoholic beverages from one to another or up or down the street in a bourbon-like atmosphere, as you suggested. All right, thank you, David. Next, we'll go to Sean Stinson with the Pendleton Times. 
Hi, Sean Sensen with the Pendleton Times. Uh, my question goes back to the color code uh, system. Um, to uh, I understand that it might take some time to clear up if someone is uh, like a resident at a nursing home or in a, a jail. Uh, but my question is, if the numbers go out on Saturday night and a county like Pendleton is incorrectly color coded uh, to where it needs to be orange or red, um, how are we going to guarantee that uh, that uh, doesn't happen or how is it ultimately corrected uh, to where it can have school uh, and also how is a county that might be incorrectly deemed as green or yellow, uh, how is that then going to then be affected if it needs to go to orange or red? Okay, just one second, Clay. Let, let me just say this, because I, I, you may miss this, but remember, remember your review board to make sure that we don't have a bias or something like that. But go ahead, sir. I'm sorry. No, 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 absolutely. So that's a great, great point. Uh, we rely on the uh, COVID task force, we rely on DHHR. Um, we would work immediately with the counties if there was an incorrect uh, caller on uh, Saturday night. Uh, the most important change that we would want to know, though, is if a county moves into the red zone. That, to me, is the most important, important uh, change. We would want to know if it's incorrect. Um, however, um, the county superintendents, uh, we actually uh, just had uh, Secretary Crouch, Dr. Marsh, Dr. Um, Amjad um, uh, join us for our weekly meetings. We want to make sure that we all have a, a very, very good relationship working with our local health officials. So um, I do believe if there was any inconsistencies, we would work directly with the counties. But now, uh, Dr. Marsh or um, Secretary Crouch, um, I don't know if there's anything else to add on that one. Yeah, this is Bill. I'm happy to, to jump in there a second, Clayton. Uh, the, the point of going to red is important. The, 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 the range between the colors are smaller until you get from orange to, uh, to red. So that classification is, is 10 to 25 going to orange and it would be for a county to jump into the red incorrectly I think would be difficult but the question is is an excellent question and as I said earlier these are point in time calculations and we even have labs who provide information who might provide us information that instead of yesterday may have come in we may have a couple of labs that are two days old so then the correction goes back instead of just one day, two days. So very difficult to have uh, live data that gives you a calculation that's, that's complete in the system we have. The one thing that I think will prohibit this as much as possible is speeding up the turnaround time in the labs. And again, with uh, General Hoyer's people trying to get those numbers uh, accurately and quickly. So that's a great question. All I can say at this point is we will do everything we can to make sure those numbers are accurate. And as numbers change, we will let you know that. Come back to me just a second. Uh, David, I, I know this, and I know this well too. You've got a lot of kids and parents and now, you know, kids are practicing football and, and they're playing, so they're practicing soccer or whatever it may be, you know, volleyball. You know, you've got, you've got kids that are performing in our bands and majorettes and cheerleaders and, and, and lots and lots and lots of ways to be affected. But I can promise you, I can absolutely promise all, that's why we have all these layers, you know, to assure against a bias or a mistake. But if we move from a green to a yellow, well, we're not going to get terribly concerned if we would happen to have made a mistake. But if we move from a yellow to an orange or an orange to a red, then we're on high alert. Because if we move from yellow to orange and we can't participate in competition, we know that's going to significant impact, significantly impact lots and lots and lots. And so we're going to check it and double check and double check and triple check and review with our people and see if there's a bias or anything like that. But we're going to make sure, we're going to make absolutely sure as we put those, numbers, put those colors out. Yeah. Yes, sir. The only other thing I would say, and, and, and people have really covered this well, but there will be most counties where things will be clear. 
and, and as they're clear, then that will be the, the final dispensation for the color coding of that county. But there may be some counties that have walked the borderline during the week where they've been sort of going back and forth from say yellow to orange or, or hopefully not orange to red. But as we go forward, if you go red and we're sure of it, then you stop. But it's the yellow to orange that, that we're really, really concerned about, as the governor said. And so we do have a expert panel that we can call on who are really made up of uh, statistical people, um, public health people and epidemiology people who will assist us in those rare categories where those kind of um, decision points need to be made because of the importance of that. All right, thank you, Sean. Uh, our last question today comes from Steve Adams with Ogden Newspapers. Uh, yeah, this is Steve Adams of Ogden Newspapers. And this is a question for, uh, for uh, Secretary Crouch. Uh, and I don't know if this has gotten to the state yet, so you may not have an answer for it. I know that uh, the uh, health departments of uh, Millhall Valley and I think Roan County are putting together a joint release uh, regarding a couple of nursing home outbreaks in those two counties. I believe they're fairly small. Uh, I didn't know if uh, the state or DHHR had any uh, information on those or what facilities those, uh, those were at. Thank you. Yes, uh, this is Phil. Uh, I'm, I may have that outbreak report. I haven't had a chance to, to spend much time with that this morning. We are notified of those outbreaks uh, fairly quickly. It's uh, pretty. Uh, it, it's not uh, often that we uh, don't get those uh, early, but many times the health departments do uh, press releases on those, and, and we learn of those during that, uh, that, that period. So, Ina, are you aware of those at all? I know of one in Roan County. I don't know of a cluster of smaller outbreaks that you might be referring to. We are aware of one in Roan County and the larger ones around the state. So what are the county are you referring to? Uh, Roan Besides County Roan. and Wood County. Wood County? We will certainly have a report on those uh, on Monday uh, for you. All right, thank you, Steve. Uh, Governor Justice, I'll, put, I'll uh, turn it back to you. Okay, I've got just two or three things to go, th go, go through real quickly. Uh, you know, I made an emergency declaration and everything, you know, and, and, and that, was, that really is to expire. I started today and it's to go through next Sunday. You know, there was a emergency declaration in regard to preparedness and everything, but I, I said earlier that it went through all, all the, the month of September, and that's, that's not correct. It, it expires this Sunday. Uh, the, you know, there was a question, and I think, uh, you know, uh, maybe Ryan a asked this question. I, I can't recall who, but, uh, but it was in regard to basically just this. You know, if our schools need more money for PPE, or cleanliness, or clean, cleanliness, or, or cleaning, you know, materials or whatever like that. What, what really are are we going to do, you know? And uh, and and with the with the thought in mind that, well, you know, we may very well not have the money to be able to do this. Well, that's not the case. That's just plain not the case. And I appreciate the question because it's always good, but. But you see, with what we're doing, especially the great work, all the revenue people and everything, we're watching this. We're watching this every single day. And, and, and we're watching the dollars and how the dollars flow. We're absolutely on this. And the reason we're not going to run out of money and everything here or there is because we're managing it. We're doing exactly what we should do. And that's our job. You know, uh, the other thing I want to go back to, to this uh, state of preparedness, we're declaring a state of preparedness, you know, because of the tropical depression that's coming and everything, and that will expire on Sunday. The, the month of September will be a month that will be dedicated to preparedness and, 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 you know, where we can work and just, you know, better make ourselves prepared, you know, in case of a disaster that could come. Now. Last thing is this, 
And that is by your questions. And, and now I am, I am going to really uh, speak well of all the great people that are doing a lot of this work. And just think about it. Your questions oftentimes come up to being, you know, what is, what is a situation or what is a, an exception, you know, or what is the ruling here, or ruling there? Well, the bottom line by your questions, you're seeing that the difficulty and the complexities of all the stuff that's going on. There is no playbook. We've not done this. No one's done this. You know, you've got great people that are trying to put this together on the fly and to be able to make it work and craft it, tweak it, and make it work. You know, from the standpoint of this color coding, nobody in the nation's done this. And you've got great people that are continuing to try to tweak it and make it work. Whether it be the National Guard or our Department of Ed or all of our health community or all the local you know, input that's coming from the superintendents or the local health departments, all the absolute greatness that's coming from the experts that you see every day, you've got a lot of people that are giving it everything they got all the time. And doggone if they're not doing really, really good stuff. So absolutely keep asking your questions because every time you ask a question, it brings, it makes all of us think just a little harder and everything. But it's tough stuff. And it's complicated, and nobody's got the playbook. Nowhere we can go to figure out what to do except West Virginians figure it out yourselves. And so uh, I commend a lot, a lot, a lot of great workers. You know who you are. There's no point in me talking and, and saying, saying, you know, calling out names. But the only last thing I'd say is we're trying to do every bit of this with as much local control as we possibly can because we feel like those people know it and know it the very best. But I'll end by just saying this, this last of my last, and that is from a money standpoint, the state's in good shape. From the money standpoint of what we think is still out there to come from additional stimulus, it's gonna really, really, really be beneficial. From the money standpoint of where the state is today, I mean, just think about it. We started the month of July with a $44 million surplus and an additional $205 million that was really income tax dollars that we didn't collect in April. And so we started July, I think, with a 249 or it could have been 239, I'm sorry, surplus, million dollar surplus. The month of August is trending toward, it looks like it's going to be a good month. You know, absolutely the state has dollars. If we have a need for our children, or we have a need for our teachers or service personnel, we're going to do it. So anyway, thank you so much. God bless all of you.